This conference will now be recorded. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Blake Aldridge with the Upper Trinity Regional Water District and the Upper Trinity Conservation Trust. Uh, welcome to our virtual Watershed Partners Breakfast. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, please uh, try to remember to keep your uh, microphone muted um, and your camera off if you want to, uh, but at least the microphone off um, until question and answer times, or if you have a question, you can put it in any time uh, in the chat box and we'll try to get to those. Uh, if you are wanting uh, the CEU credits for the Texas Floodplain Management Association, I'll be sending the attendee list to them um, afterwards. And um, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, the Vice President of the Upper Trinity Conservation Trust, uh, Thomas Muir. Right, we, we certainly appreciate you uh, joining us today for our virtual breakfast. Um, <laughs> I had to laugh a little bit. We always do, uh, Upper Trinity always does a good job of serving us good breakfast at these events. And so to call it a virtual breakfast, uh, I chuckled because we're not getting to provide you much breakfast and we're having to let you rely on your own, own provision there. Um, I guess that's pretty indicative of this past year where we all are adjusting um, how we're doing things. And we appreciate you coming along for the ride with us um, for today's uh, learning sessions um, as we all kind of make do. Hopefully your virtual breakfast is as good as the Upper Trinity breakfast usually is. Uh, I can't say that mine was because uh, it usually, they usually treat us really well. Um, despite the lack of food, uh, we're certainly glad you've chosen to spend some time with us this morning. Um, if you're on this call, you probably have a passion for water, much like those of us at the Conservation Trust do. So again, we're, uh, we're glad to share passions with you and hopefully give you an opportunity to learn today. Um, Blake has put up on your screen uh, a slide discussing the trust. We are a 501c3 nonprofit uh, land trust that was established in 2010. It, um, this allows us to receive conservation easements in a tax advantage manner for donors and developers um, while accomplishing the public good of protecting our water quality and our watersheds. So this is one of those um, areas that I consider a win-win situation for all involved. If you're an engineer or a developer, um, I think we can help you in a tax advantage manner and the public interest can be served for our environmental areas and our watershed. So help. the purpose is to preserve our riparian areas and these key watershed features that feed into our lakes and streams um, in order to get continue to provide that critical resource of water to our whole region. You can see we focus in several different areas, different lake bodies like Louisville, Lake Ray Roberts and Lake Grapevine and are willing to accept and able to accept conservation of those watershed areas uh, to help uh, conserve that natural resource. Again, uh, one of our key uh, purposes is landowner outreach and education. Um, today is part of that outreach and education uh, segment of our mission. We want to obviously accomplish these various missions in partnership with so many of the stakeholders of which many of you are, uh, whether it's cities, counties, engineering firms, developers, or just other interested parties in our environment. We hope to be a good resource for all uh, stakeholders involved. So again, thank you for that opportunity. We'll move ahead here and uh, to the next slide and visit um, just to share the, those involved in our board. Um, in your various circles, you may run across some of these individuals. This is a volunteer board, so you can know that it really is um, these individual individuals' hearts that are involved. 
they're donating their time to give to try to uh, forward the purpose of the trust and the public good of our watersheds. But if you know any of these people and you have questions about the trust, you can always feel free to reach out to, to one of us to discuss it in greater detail. Um, we're, we're happy to do that and wanted to give that list to you for that purpose. Um, the last slide here that I'm uh, responsible for today is our acknowledgement of our watershed partners um, that have come alongside us. We just want to give a hearty thank you to all of you who have partnered with us in, um, in the relationship of moving um, this education and awareness forward in our region. We all know that the key to success in many strategic ventures is the relationships involved. And um, probably more important than almost anything is the relationships. And we certainly appreciate those listed here. And even if you've just been, you know, dealing with us in other areas, whether you're on this screen or not, we appreciate the relationship that you um, have had as you've invested in the future of our watershed and more specifically in the Upper Trinity Conservation Trust. So with that, I would just uh, like to thank you again for joining us in this unique format. And we look forward to learning today together. Um, Blake, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you, Thomas. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make our first presenter, um, Dr. Sam Atkinson, hand it over to him, let him get set up um, while I introduce him. Uh, Dr. Sam Atkinson is the former director of the Advanced Envir Environmental Research Institute, uh, and now he's a current scholar in that same institute and he's a Regents Professor of Environmental Science at the University of North Texas in Denton. Uh, results from uh, some of his previous studies form much of the basis for the Denton County Greenbelt Plan, and today he's going to be talking about um, prioritizing riparian corridors and urban watersheds for restoration. So uh, with that, uh, I'll leave it up to you, Dr. Atkinson. All right, can can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and my screen just went kind of strange, so I don't know if you can see my slides. I'm gonna, I've got some PowerPoint slides. Let me uh, put that Wait. full screen on that. Can you see this now? Yes, yes, it is okay. full screen now. All right, terrific. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much for inviting me to the uh, to the breakfast this morning. Uh, my breakfast was a cup of coffee, which is usually what my breakfast is, so uh, I guess I didn't miss out on a lot. Um, I'm going to uh, turn my pointer on. There we go. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you can see me very well or not. Uh, I have been in a pretty good uh, home isolation for about a year now. It's uh, It's been a year since I've been to the barber, and uh, so this is the first time I've had a ponytail since uh, I was in college. And uh, one of my first things once I get vaccinated and uh, back out in the real world uh, functioning somewhat normally will be to go to a to a barber and get my hair cut. My, my wife likes my hair long. That's how I had long hair when I met her in college. We've been married this whole time, so she likes it now that I've got uh, longer hair. She doesn't really want me to go to the barber, but uh, it's a pain in the butt, really, to have long hair. So so I'm headed back to the barber as soon as, as, soon as I can. Uh, the talk that I want to give you today... Uh, looks at a project that was uh, really funded, a, a grant from the uh, Upper Trinity uh, Regional Water District uh, back in about 2010. And that grant was for coming up with a way of prioritizing riparian corridors that were of high quality that could be preserved, uh, maybe through uh, you know some of the trusts that you guys are talking about, uh, to protect water quality, and so I'm going to I'm going to summarize that pretty quickly this morning and go over that, and that led me to uh, another idea of using the same database to see if we could identify riparian corridors that needed restoration, and that idea really came to me because I was. Uh, uh, I was on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Environmental Advisory Board for about seven years, and after I'd been on it for a couple of years, they asked me to look at a process 
that they had in place, this kind of nationwide process where uh, communities would propose restoration projects to the Corps of Engineers, and then that district office, like the Fort Worth District of the Corps of Engineers, they would then make a proposal to headquarters to see if they could get funding to help these restoration projects. And the system that they had in place was a little bit haphazard, and um, and they they thought that it could be improved. So I was on a committee with uh, two, three other people, and we looked at that in detail. And that made me think about this particular project, this uh, Upper Trinity Regional Water District project, looking at preservation, to see if we could turn that into restoration, uh, kind of a model that points out where would you do restoration first if you could. So, um, so the first thing I want to show you is this satellite image. If you're not used to looking at false color infrared satellite imagery, uh, you and I cannot see infrared light, but the sensors on the satellite can. So what the computer does is it takes that infrared light and shifts it into the red color spectrum that you and I can see on the computer. And then what you and I normally see as red gets shifted to green, and what you and I normally see as green gets shifted to blue, and then what you and I normally see as blue kind of gets shifted off the screen. We can't see it. So what you're looking at here is a false color infrared satellite image from 1984 of the North Texas region. And if you can see my laser pointer, uh, Blake, can you see the laser pointer? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, I'm going yes. to assume that you can see the laser pointer. Here's the DFW airport. You can see Lake Grapevine here. Here's Lake Louisville. What I'm going to do is turn this quick animation on and the satellite image from 2016 is going to come in from the left hand side of the screen. It just overlays directly on top of the 1984 image. And what I want you to look at is the change in the imagery. Now, again, if you're not used to looking at false color infrared imagery, this bright these bright colors, the kind of the whites and the, not this gray, that, that's a that's a pasture, that's usually kind of a sh a short uh, herbaceous lands, but the brighter colors that you see here, that's all urban hardscape. Those are parking lots and roofs and things like that. And what I want you to do is as this image comes in from the left, I want you to look at the change and, and this image will go back and forth a little bit, left and right to kind of reveal and, and hide and reveal and hide. So let me see if I can't get this running here. There it is. Okay, so just kind of notice how much more of this bright area that happens. And this is a 32 year span. And I'm gonna point out, it's gonna go all the way back to the left. I'm gonna point out just a couple of things here. So notice what happens in the North Fort Worth area here. You get lots of development going on here. Look what happens around the airport and around Louisville. Leela, if you know Leela, see it's one of the few green places. But if you look at the at the watershed to the east of Lake Louisville, this is Frisco and Plano and that whole area, you can see how rapidly urbanizing the North Texas area is. And so to protect our water quality, this idea about looking at our corridors uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. So uh, I'm going to kind of jump to the a little bit of the conclusion right here. I'm not going to show too many technical graphs, but I just want to show you this one. This is from a U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, database called Landfire. And when we look at the 90 watersheds in this study that I'm going to tell you about, I haven't mentioned them yet, but I'm going to point these out to you in just a second. Of the 90 sub-watersheds, this database shows us the percent change in urban land use in that sub-watershed. And so you can see that uh, you know everything is increasing. This is the 100% line. We've got some watersheds that have more than 100%. You know, we got this one out here that's nearly 700% increase in urbanization in that watershed. And then on this axis, we have the percent change in the riparian corridor. So with this database, we could we could pull out just the riparian corridor and look at how much urbanization is in that corridor. And we define the corridor in this study um, as um, 10 meters on either side of the river of the stream channel. So this is a 20 meter wide channel, so very narrow. 
especially for those of you who do watershed management, you know that that's a really narrow corridor, but that's what we that's what we focused on because we thought that's where we could do some uh, you know some management opportunities. And you can see that in many cases the corridor uh, increases more than the watershed in general, which is kind of a disturbing thing. So and so you can see this R squared. This says that uh, you know there's a very high correlation between what's going on in the watershed itself and what's going on in the in those riparian corridors. So the study um, was in North Texas. Those of you who know the uh, Texas Water Development Board planning regions, uh, this study is a little bit in region B, but primarily in region C. Uh, here is the Lake Louisville watershed. So the Trinity River, you know, flows down uh, to the Gulf. So a little bit of this study was up in Montague County, but uh, it's mainly uh, Cook, Grayson, Collin, and uh, Denton County, a little bit of the corner of Wise County here. Uh, so most of you know, I don't, I don't need to spend much time on this, but riparian corridors are really important ecosystems. They, uh, they contribute to nutrient cycling, uh, removing contaminants, purifying water, stabilizing the banks, uh, uh, ameliorating temperature deviation for the species that live in those uh, ecosystems, flow stabilization, flood attenuation, habitat preservation. These are all considered uh, ecosystem services in the new vernacular. And I just want to say that term is a little um, restrictive, ecosystem services, because an ecosystem service, by definition of the, of the academic field that, that has kind of coined this term, says that ecosystem services are the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. Now, that's important uh, to know that distinction because, of course, ecosystem Ecosystems provide services to many other species than people. But the reason it's important for us is people who pay the bill for things like preservation or restoration, they need to know what they're getting for their, you know, their, their money. Uh, and it's hard to turn all ecosystem services into monetary values. And so there's a lot of work on trying to figure out how do we um, how do we value these services that you and I are getting benefit from? And how do we account for that when we're trying to figure out, is it worth spending $100,000 on this restoration project? Are we going to get $100,000 worth of benefit back out of it? And, and again, that problem is that sometimes you may be able to, <clears throat> to account exactly for $70,000 of benefits because you can quantify that. But the other benefits are harder to capture in a monetary sense. So we're looking at things like carbon storage and regulation of climate and water flow, maintenance of soil fertility. But this particular study looked really at these corridors in terms of clean water. Uh, and this is a little graphic that we found a few years ago, and I don't even have a citation for it any longer. But this idea of preservation versus restoration says, we should really do preservation first. That's the first line of defense. That's where we're trying to maintain the current conditions of an ecosystem. Typically, this is easier to implement and it's less expensive. Once you get into restoration, it becomes more complicated. It's more expensive. Um, oftentimes, you've got multiple jurisdictions who deal with this and might have to pay uh, the cost for restoration. So this becomes more difficult. So that's why the original study focused on this and then later, uh, we decided to think about how could we use that same database for restoration. So the initial project uh, focused on a very specific ecosystem service, that's a provisioning of clean water. And what we wanted to do was develop a GIS-based model. We wanted to uh, do a pilot study where we would actually do some field monitoring to, to verify whether or not this computer-based GIS model was actually working. Um, we did the, uh, a statistical comparison between the model and some monitoring results, and then we ultimately applied this model. We found that it worked uh, well enough for us that we applied it to the entire Louisville Lake watershed. So the riparian assessment, this is the field work that we wanted to do, which is hard work, it's expensive, it's time consuming. So if we could come up with a computer model that gives us roughly the same results, that is much, much easier to do. And so the first thing we wanted to do was do the field work to collect the data out in the field. Um, 
Oh, and here's the GIS model. I don't, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this technical part of it. I'll show you the variables in the model in just a second. But I just want to say that the preservation model, we called it, we called it the water quality corridor management model. And that, ac <clears throat> that acronym, WQCM, we started calling it WICM. So for us here at the university, we know this is the WICM model. And the first round was Wickham Preservation, or I'll refer to it as Wickham P, as you see right here. Uh, the scores can range from zero to 50, and higher scores indicate more value for protecting that riparian corridor. Here are the components, uh, vegetation, what kind of vegetation is in the corridor, how erosive is the soil, how steep is the slope of this corridor, because the steeper it is, the more erosive it can be, a uh, floodplain, this was the uh, FEMA floodplain, and the, our, our thinking here was that the more of the floodplain of a riparian corridor that was defined in the 100-year floodplain of FEMA, the more protection it already had, because there are certain things that you can and cannot do in a FEMA floodplain. So there was already some protection there, so we, we thought that was a good thing to include. And then the final thing is the corridor which you can see is the ratio of the corridor to the subwatershed area. And you can envision that if, you, if you're trying to protect a corridor, the bigger that corridor is in a given watershed, the more protection you're going to get. So if you have a big, if you have a big subwatershed and a very narrow slice of, um, of riparian corridor, you're not gonna get a lot of protection in that watershed. But if you have a watershed and it's dominated by its riparian corridor, then you can get a lot more protection with this concept. Okay, so here is uh, that satellite image again with the watershed draped on top of it. Uh, I want to just focus for a second on the eastern portion. Uh, if you'll remember in that satellite image, this is where we had uh, a lot of urbanization uh, going on there. This is where we did the field study where we wanted to see if our GIS model worked. So we looked at that particular area and we had to figure out what field monitoring program we wanted to use to collect field data. And there are a bunch of them available. We wanted to make sure that it would focus on uh, riparian areas. We didn't want any complex field or lab measurements to, uh, to complicate things. We wanted to make sure we selected an approach that was not region specific. And we wanted one that didn't have a reference site because we didn't we did not have a reference site that we could uh, refer to in the North Texas area. There were lots of them out there. We ended up using this one from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Stream Visual Assessment Protocol, and that was simply uh, it's a scoring system. You get a score sheet for each sub watershed that you're scoring, and there's some instructions on how you how you assign these points. But ultimately what happens is uh, you assign a total score. So if you look at all the numbers that are in boxes here, if you add those up, in this case, they added up to 76. That was a specific sub watershed in our, in our pilot area. And then uh, you know, the way this one works is we had nine different boxes that had a number in it. We took the total score and divided by nine. That gave us a, a score for this particular riparian corridor of 8.4 which according to this particular approach said that was a good uh, uh, riparian corridor. So we took that pilot area, divided it into 133 sub watersheds. We applied our GIS model to it first. So this is our Wickham scores and the color scheme on my legend doesn't match over here very well, but you can see the yellow scores were the ones that had the lowest priority for preservation. And then the darkest ones are the, are the corridors that had the highest priority for uh, preservation. Then we went uh, to the field and these stars that you see here, we went to 40 different sub watersheds, 10 in each of the uh, corridors, uh, I'm sorry, in each of the quartiles, and we applied that that methodology, that field methodology, and then we wanted to compare the scores from the GIS model to the uh, field uh, score. And this is what we found. This is the Wickham score on the x-axis. So the higher the score, the higher the priority. And here is that uh, uh, visual assessment protocol uh, score. And again, the higher that score, the higher the quality of the corridor. 
it was a very statistically significant uh, relationship, even though it was only an R square of 0.58. But in environmental work, you know, if you can get above a 0.5, oftentimes you're feeling that you're on a you're on the right track. You you know you're you're in, headed in the right direction. The field monitoring, uh, some of the sites that had high priority looked like these two. Some of the sites that had low priority for preservation looked like these two. Um, one of the things that we did find is that sometimes upstream and downstream were quite different. So here is one particular site that we went to. If you look upstream, that's not a terribly high quality corridor to try to preserve. But if you just turn around 180 degrees and look downstream, uh, you can see that the quality starts to go up. It, it tends to be the landowner who, uh, you know, kind of in this particular case, the, the two different landowners upstream and downstream had a had a problem. And then there were sites where we had fairly good scores, but you know they were really trashy because uh, you know there was there was something else going on in the watershed where people were allowing the trash. So those were some of the reasons we didn't have a higher R square. I think uh, here's just an image of uh, one of the the high quality both in the GIS model and in the uh, uh, visual assessment protocol and we took pictures the whole time we were out there you know sometimes uh, things looked pretty good you know sometimes there was really no riparianness to this uh, corridor uh, lots of trash in places and that. so that was uh, you know that was what we saw we applied the technique to all 90 sub watersheds and here is what we found the darker, the darkest of these sub watersheds are where the riparian corridors are that we thought should be targeted first for preservation. And then the lowest, the, the yellow, these are places where those corridors probably can't be preserved at this point. Okay, so that then led to, oh, I just very quickly want to say the result of that project was uh, this interactive CD where you could go to, this is all uh, on a this, on a CD at the time, it could probably be turned online now. I want to show you, we're going to select one particular watershed, number 37, and just show you the information you can get on this uh, CD. Uh, here's that watershed. It is a high priority for preservation watershed. And then you can look at each factor that uh, contributed to its uh, overall score. So if we look at land use, uh, we can now calculate the total amount of land use in the corridor and the different types of uh, land use. We can look at slope and see where we have high slopes or where we have lower slopes. Uh, we can see where is the 100 year floodplain according to FEMA on this. And then we can look at the erosivity uh, of the, uh, uh, the soil as well. Okay, so now, uh, and I'm running just a little bit late, I'll, I'll be finishing just a couple of minutes. The, uh, the idea of restoration, and again, it was my, my assignment on the Corps of Engineers Advisory Board to think about how they were prioritizing restoration projects that led us to this idea. And restoration, and this is a Corps of Engineers kind of a definition, reestablishment of characteristics of an ecosystem such as biodiversity and ecological function that were prevalent before degradation. So what the Corps of Engineers was saying is we don't want to restore to a level that was better than it was before this degradation started occurring. We want to get to the point of what was the quality before the degradation and we don't really want to make it better than that unless it's just very easy to do. And so again, we were focused on the benefits that people obtain from these ecosystems. And this led to this question about looking at the old versus the new model. If a riparian corridor has poor scores for preservation, does that mean it has a high priority for restoration? In other words, are, you know, can you just have exactly the same model and just look at the other end of the scores instead of the, the high quality scores, look at the low quality scores. And it turns out you can't do that. Here is, we, we, we ran two different models, the preservation model that we've been talking about. I'll show you the restoration model in just a second. And there was, there was no relationship between the two scores. Uh, there's a general downward trend that says as preservation score goes up, then the restoration score goes down, but it's not a very strong, it's not statistically significant, it's not a very strong relationship. So we uh, went on to this next step. We wanted to focus on restoration of stream corridors. 
Here is the model. It's a little simpler. It only has three variables, but this is from exactly the same database. And we applied this model uh, to the same 90 sub watersheds. This is the new model. This is the one focused on restoration. And I just want to compare the two. So if, if we look at the, the original model, the Wickham P and then the Wickham R for restoration, the color schemes are not exactly identical, but again, the darkest colors have the highest priority for either preservation or for restoration. You can see that, uh, you know, restoration, we've got, you know, we got down closer to the, to the reservoir itself is where we see that we need more restoration, which is where all of that urbanization is occurring. Just to give you a sense of what this model does for us, so here is a corridor that has high priority for restoration. This is that red color. And when we zoom in on, a, on some imagery, you can see here's a corridor and it's, you know, it's been stripped of vegetation. Now in this same watershed, we've got a little bit of area that has some, uh, has some uh, vegetation in it, but there's a lot of area that is really degraded uh, in terms of the vegetation itself. So that's, uh, so that was picked up by our model for, rest, for high priority for restoration. Uh, here's low priority for restoration. This is that yellow color that we saw. You can see here's that particular watershed. And you can see on the corridor here, almost the entire corridor is vegetated with trees. And so we felt pretty good that our model was picking up, um, you know, was picking up these uh, corridors that, this is probably one much more suited for preservation, but uh, not, not too much for uh, restoration. So management plans, and I'm almost finished, and I don't want to read this whole slide. I just want to say that preservation tends to be, you have more options for preservation. You can think about construction things to do to preserve the quality of a corridor. You can ask the landowners, the homeowners in those sub watersheds uh, to you know, follow good lawn practices nutrient disposal in terms of pets and you know don't wash your cars at home go to a, a car wash that collects the runoff and, and treats that or sends it to the wastewater treatment plant public outreach really works well for preservation plans for restoration your your um, options are a little more limited you either add things to the ecosystem to reduce whatever was degrading it originally like planting forbs and trees or you remove from the ecosystem those things that are degrading it, such as uh, non-native species or other damaging types of species, and you try to remove the nutrients that's getting into the water. This is specifically for water quality now. One of the things that uh, is really useful in this particular model that we did not foresee as we were building it is uh, represented in this graph. Now this graph is a little complicated. Let me just show that the Wickham restoration priority, uh, lower scores, the way this model works, lower scores have higher priority. So these would be those dark red, uh, those dark red sub watersheds. That's the black line. So you can see of the 90 sub watersheds, the score um, is in black here. But what we can do in the model is we can tweak one variable at a time and say, what if we um, what if we plant a lot of trees in this corridor where before it didn't have very many? What if we have a vegetation strategy? That's in green. And you can see that what happens is as you get um, less and less priority for preservation, this is where vegetation starts to make improvements. What we found really interesting is that it's these, it's the soil strategy, soil stabilization strategies that really improve the scores of these uh, high priority for restoration watershed. So if we can, if we can stabilize soils, then these scores go up substantially, much better. So again, if we're focusing on restoration in the North Texas area, this model says, let's look for those corridors where we can do some uh, soil stabilization. So just in concluding remarks here, let me just say that uh, preservation and restoration actions have costs associated with them. And there's financial strategies that are needed for widespread ecological restoration to be implemented. Uh, the cost benefit uh, analysis is difficult, um, but we encourage investments in preservation and restoration 
even though the cost benefit may financially not look right, because we know that there are services that we cannot finance, or we cannot monetize. And then finally, uh, restoration activities rarely return an ecosystem to its fully functional pre-degraded status within any kind of a reasonable timeline. So preservation still is where the incentive should be. We should preserve those high quality preservation uh, riparian corridors first before we start turning to restoration. And I believe that's it. I, I may have taken just a few minutes more than I was thinking, but um, Blake, I will open it now if anybody wants to have questions. And let me see if I can uh, turn off this screen here. Yeah, we had um, a couple come in. Um, first of all, thank you for the, for the presentation and all the work that you've done in our watershed. Um, there's a couple of questions and comments about, um, you know, getting the, the data for, um, Perry Hart's asked about for Frisco or um, seeing the data be put online uh, as like a uh, accessible online. So just wanted to see if there was um, opportunity to put um, this data or information um, in a form that's accessible to the city so they so that they can use it. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to turn off the screen. I don't know if you can do that or not, Blake. Um, I'm not sure if we need to have the slide show up any longer. I'm, I'm used to Zoom instead of GoToMeeting, so I don't know how to control this one. But uh, Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the data are available. Now, the, this particular data set, it was really a proof of concept uh, for me on this model because I used the data from 2010. And so now we obviously know that uh, things have changed uh, in the last 10 years, that satellite image. Uh, I, I could have shown one from 2010 to 2016 to show the change, and it's still rapidly changing. Um, so my recommendation would be if you were interested in this to gather the same data but new data for the various different areas knowing now that I, I i think we now or at least i now feel pretty comfortable that this approach can identify both um, high quality corridors that we want to preserve for water quality purposes but also we can identify those corridors that need restoration. So the data, I mean, Upper Trinity River has all of these CDs. The CDs have all of the data included with them from you know, that older study. So it would take some amount of work to gather all of the, that same information for uh, current conditions, but that easily could be done. And, um, and now we have quite a few people at the university who know how to convert these kinds of CD-based things that are 10 years old into online, um, you know, interactive kinds of, uh, of software. Great. Um, let's see. Brian Hummel um, made a comment that soil, soil st stabilization is very important and can be accomplished <clears throat> at enhanced agricultural profit. And he provided some uh, information in there. Um, so that's great. Um, that is good, yeah. Yeah, that would, um, I, I would say that for me, the most surprising thing, I thought that vegetation was going to be the thing that uh, we would focus on and we'd wanna you know, plant all kinds of native vegetation in these corridors. Uh, so I was really, um, I, it surprised me to see that soil stabilization in those highest priority restoration corridors. That that was the that was the strategy. So uh, I'm I'm glad to know that there are some good uh, soil stabilization techniques that are in fact beneficial both uh, from water quality and an agricultural perspective. Yeah, and along the same lines, uh, can you give examples of those those uh, soil stabilization strategies? Is that in stream versus in the actual riparian area? Uh, well, the model focuses on the riparian area, uh, so it, it includes the in stream area, but I think the, mo the thing that I've read, and I'm not an expert at soil stabilization, but the thing that I've read is that there are soil additives that uh, are relatively simple to apply that would help stabilize those soils. And then the other thing would be some contour plowing 
uh, close to those riparian to, to those um, you know the the uh, banks of these uh, riparian corridors to try to prevent steep slopes from encouraging erosion. So I think those two things, soil additives, uh, topography, and then of course adding uh, good dense vegetation, you know, grasses, herbs, and forbs uh, would uh, would help stabilize as well. Okay, great. Well, that's um, all the time that we have for Dr. Atkinson. We thank you again for, for joining us and presenting your great information. Um, so, well, thank you for inviting me. It was it was great to talk to everybody, and uh, I hope the next time I see you guys, I'll have a haircut. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Um, let's see, next we have uh, Mindy White, who is the Neighborhood Services and Sustainability Manager, and Michael Kim, who is the Park Development and Operations Manager with the City of Louisville. So. And remember, just uh, whenever you want me to advance a slide, just say next or, or whatever. Sounds great. Thank you, Blake. Um, like Blake said, I'm Mindy White. Um, and Mike and I are here today to kind of give you more of an applied look of how these concepts that Dr. Atkinson was just talking about can be um, actively piloted in a community setting. So we wanted to give you a little bit of a sneak peek in a project that we have that hopefully will deal with some of these issues that we're seeing um, in our own watersheds here in Louisville. If you could advance, please. Okay, to give you some background about who we are and why this matters to us as a city, um, overall, we have several different programs that are kind of informing this initiative. First, we have what was known as our 2025 plan. It's a community-wide strategic plan that our city council uh, prioritized to look at community input and stakeholder input about what really mattered for our community and helped shape the vision for who we would be moving toward uh, a 2025 milestone. And one of the things that really rose to, to the top through this process was the strength of our, our green space in our community and how much our community valued um, those green corridors and green spaces and really recognize the benefit of protecting it and enhancing it and in fact moving it um, throughout the city and not just in our, our lake areas and in Leela. Um, and Parks and Recreation has some specific goals that are around that idea of extending these green spaces throughout our community. One of the things that they've been working on over the past couple of years is a, a pollinator way station network, if you will, that includes plantings of different pollinator plants that encourage um, a network of way stations so that our pollinators can move throughout the community. Um, and they're also looking at how can they reevaluate the access that our community has to these green spaces and how connected are they? Are they walkable and bikeable? Um, they had a grant that allowed us to um, work with the Urban Land Institute to look at um, the idea of no one in our community being further than 10 minute walk away from a park or a green space. So, so there's a lot of these ideas that are really informing a lot of the goals that we have organizationally, especially in our parks department. And also we adopted the um, Greenbelt plan in January of 2019. And we have found this to be a great resource. It's a um, wonderful toolkit that has um, best practices, suggestions, and, and ways that we can apply these concepts that come out of these ideas that came through Dr. Atkinson's research that identified these high priority watershed areas. Um, some of the things that we've done since the adoption of the Greenbelt Plan, we've designated some no-mo buffers around some of our specific streams in the community, um, looking at how we can continue to preserve the bank integrity, um, control erosion, especially during flood events and improve our water quality. Um, and we've also looked at areas that we could identify for future restoration planting projects where we can remove some invasive species that are there, um, help introduce some of these plants that are native and that would help further stabilize these areas. Next, please. So good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mike, the Park Operations and Development Manager for the City of Louisville. Um, I'm gonna go over a little bit on the background of a specific project that we, uh, we just recently constructed um, at the end of 2020, early 2021. So the the uh, project was completed in January of 2021, and the main goal um, or goals for this particular uh, canoe and kayak launch that we wanted to um, 
uh, introduced and installed in the city of Louisville was number one, accessibility. Um, this particular location was used by a lot of paddlers um, and a lot of uh, avid kayakers and, and canoers. Um, it, you know, as a unofficial kind of launch point. And so um, this conversation was had with the city and the city manager's office, as well as the parks department. And we identified this location as uh, the best launch point for um, not just, you know, uh, avid kayakers and canoers, but a lot of people who wanted access to um, the river and uh, a natural green space. Um, in, in this area. And so also on this, we actually um, are now a part of the Trinity, the, the Trinity Paddling Trail is now a part of the National Park Service, um, I guess, recognized uh, paddling trail. Um, and so I, I believe there's a link right there, Blake. Is it possible for you to click on that? And, and Essentially, what this link just basically shows, it takes you to the, the web page for the Trinity uh, River Paddling Trail, and it goes over all the uh, different, um, uh, I guess, the water, the water systems that are designated uh, in, a, in the NRT database, and we are, we are one of them. So, um, so recognition uh, nationally in regards to what we're doing out there in the city. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Blake. And so here is a uh, a real quick look in the with an aerial in terms of the location. So you can see that I-35 and Sam Rayburn uh, Tollway uh, cross, and our site is just actually north, um, I guess northeast, um, and adjacent right there by the Trinity, and that. Uh, larger roadway right there is Hebron Parkway. Um, and where you guys see that star is the location of our canoe, uh, our new canoe kayak launch. Next slide. In uh, one point I wanted to mention, um, sorry, Blake, if you can go back to the last one, um, uh, the last slide, to the point what Dr. Atkinson was saying about urbanized uh, watershed, you can tell um, and you can see from this aerial that uh, this the location of the canoe kayak launch is adjacent to a lot of um, development and, and urbanization. Next slide. So this slide is basically kind of going over the site design um, and there's an image on the upper left hand corner of the completed dock project. Um, this was a, a, a lot larger of a uh, launch site. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are, are um, you know, uh, avid kayakers or if you've ever canoed um, uh, or kayaked, but typically, you know, uh, a, a soft launch point or, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, 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 an easy slope into the, into the river or the lake, um, riprap, you'll typically see some steps um, or, or stairs that lead you down to the water. This, this site has, uh, you know, parking, um, ADA access down to the river. The docking system is both uh, accessible um, to able body and also, um, you know, people of all levels can use it. Um, there is, you know, just a, a, a lot of amenities um, to something of this a project of this magnitude. Um, next slide, Blake. So uh, a little bit of uh, history on the, the launch site. So previously the planting attempts on this site was uh, the parks department generally just left it alone because uh, what it was mainly, what was mainly there was Johnson grass, a, a field of Johnson grass. Uh, the city had gone initially and put riprap on the bank um, to help with the erosion. Um, there was a lot of uh, issues uh, when the when the river would flood, and this site particularly would flood a lot. Um, a lot of fishermen and paddlers would go down th go down there and access the river, um, like I said, in an unofficial way. Um, and oftentimes there was safety concerns and 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 things of that matter. 
Um, and then again, like I said, issues with the hydrological patterns. There was a lot of flooding in this area. Um, even during normal rain seasons, uh, when the core would release uh, from the dam, uh, it would really inundate this whole entire area. Um, and then, you know, now with this, uh, the canoe kayak launch being built, um, we're kind of taking into, con not kind of, but we are taking into consideration uh, strategies and methods where we can bring in, you know, native vegetation, uh, native vegetation that wants to be um, in the aquatic uh, environment and uh, will do well in areas where it's inundated by water for long periods of time um, and, and kind of contribute to uh, water quality and uh, helping with, you know, combat erosion along the banks of our river. Blake, could you go to the next slide? Okay, and I'll, I'll hand it back to Mindy on this one. Thanks, Mike. Um, so to touch a little bit more in depth on some of the things that, that uh, Mike was saying that we hope to see come about with this project, we've had some struggles on site um, just with the natural topography and what happens um, with rain events and with water releases from the dam. And so taking all this into account, we wanted to create a strategy that makes sense, um, that's sustainable, that really helps capture some of the best features of this area and preserves our water quality as well. So looking at this restoration project, going in there with a new eye and bringing in some different kinds of plants and stabilization for the banks than what we've had previously, um, these are the, the benefits that we're hoping to see as a result. We're hoping to see banks that are no longer going to, to produce those great amounts of erosion and deposition into the stream. Uh, we're looking to create habitat environments for our native pollinators, our birds, other fauna in the area, um, so that it's really enriching the ecological benefits of the area. And then also we're looking at the idea that this is going to allow us to reduce our mowing needs for this park, park space. And there's some secondary benefits for that as well. We're lowering our emissions by um, having less mowing cycles and that's going to further improve our air quality in the area anytime we can cut back on, on the mowing that we're doing. Um, but finally, the piece that I think is really unique about this is that this is an area that has the potential to have high public contact with folks that are going out there and either fishing or utilizing it to launch their canoes and kayaks. There's really an opportunity there for public outreach and education where we can talk about what we did and why we did it and the impact that we're having on the water system as a result. So creating an opportunity to, to also install this interpretive signage that includes that information on the plants that we've put in, the animal species that they might see, and then some of these concepts around watershed protection and stormwater management that can help uh, the public learn as well as um, just appreciate nature when they're out there on site as well. Next. And so when we look at what this actual plan looks like, you know, we've really thought about how can we have a collaborative team um, that comes to the space with all these ideas and experiences in a way that's going to make this work. And our parks team is very well qualified. Um, we have Mike on board, who's our, our landscape architect. We have some team members underneath him, certified arborists. Um, we have a master naturalist. We have a team member that has a background um, in horticulture and ecology that's done aquatic plantings previously. So really a wealth of experience on our parks team that will help us move this forward. And then I've been involved as well in my role as, as sustainability manager. So our timeline that we're hoping to hit um, in this next summer, we're really going to look at how can we get on uh, control of on-site species that are invasive that we really don't want to see in the long term and what can we do to abate the litter that's on site um, that's either coming off of Hebron or is floodable litter or is there by people that are utilizing the site how can we get a control on that and then in the fall we'll start looking at our first round of plantings and then after those plantings are in we're going to look at establishing and implementing a maintenance and monitoring program for the site so how do we know the plants that are in there are viable? Are they successful? Um, do we need to replant anything? Are there any um, places we need to shore up? Are we still seeing erosion? Are there litter issues? You know, how are we really going to look on making this be a long-term successful project? 
And we're also hoping to engage with our community members and volunteers on that as well to really get them engaged with the site and, and also uh, make sure that it is sustainable in the long term. And then the plant list that's that's been put together for the site is really um, a good mix. And this is based off of back when, when Mike showed you the site plan originally, the to topography is fairly steep in certain areas. So it's got some unique characteristics. Some areas of it are going to be um, better suited to more of like an aquatic, semi-aquatic plant. Other areas that are higher up might be better for some of our native grasses or wildflower mixes, um, maybe even a few trees. So it's been very intentional how we've put together the plant list for the site. Next, please. And this map shows three different colored areas. And those three different colored areas are what I was kind of referring to about how certain characteristics of plants will be better suited for certain areas of um, the actual site itself. So each one of these colors has a unique plant list that includes a unique mix of those um, various wildflowers, grasses, and so on. Next. And this is just a snapshot of what some of the plants are that we are suggesting to plant on site. Um, it's a broad sampling. There's a much longer list than what, what this represents, um, but it just gives you an idea of what you might see once these plants are established um, on the site itself. Next, and I'll pass it back over to Mike. So the uh, ongoing and ma maintenance and monitoring strategy, as uh, Mindy was alluding to, will be, uh, my team will be going out there once the vegetation is established. Um, we will be, uh, you know, weekly taking note on how the vegetation is doing, um, how uh, the, you know, the litter uh, situation is being handled. Um, we have this particular site as one of our routes um, during our, for our sanitation team. We have our Leela crew, which is the, uh, Louisville Lake um, Environmental Learning Area team that they are uh, well versed in uh, native uh, vegetation and the ecology and the the the, the Trinity River. Um, they will be going out there and making sure that everything is is going well. And then, um, you know, what we need to do after we find that, uh, let's say some some of the areas are doing well and some areas are not. How are we going to be uh, going there and uh, Taking care of of, of these the, the plant material and the uh, the erosion issues. Uh, frequency wise, you know, this is again, like I said, it's going to be a weekly thing for us um, for our maintenance team, as well as when we have flooding event events or a lot of rain. Um, we're going to be out there uh, extra days to make sure that things are going well and that the accumulation of trash and debris. Uh, are not inhibiting the success of the vegetation growth um, or are not contributing to um, other issues that we would find in this. And, and so as Mindy said, this is an ongoing uh, project for us. This is something that the community uh, asked for, not just in Louisville, but in our neighboring cities um, and in the, in the Metroplex where uh, people really want to have uh, clean facilities for um, you know when they recreate on the on the river and 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 at the same time contributing to uh, water quality and education. Uh, yeah, so I think that's about it. The next slide should be our information. Uh, we can take questions now, and also if there are any other questions or thoughts or anything you want to share. I think I see something on the chat room where. Uh, someone put that there's going to be a webinar on NC that NCT COG is um, presenting for trash screen systems. So um, uh, anything, any questions or any other information that would be helpful to us, uh, please take our information. And then for now, I guess we'll take questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mindy and Mike, for uh, sharing the information about this great project, the, the kayak launch. Uh, looks looks great. Um, I didn't see any questions come through um, about your presentation particularly, so if anyone has one, go ahead and put it in the chat. Otherwise, um, going back to the, uh, the no-mo areas on the creeks, um, about how wide are those no-mo area buffers at this point? And, um, about how many creeks would you say have that that buffer on them? 
So we pra we practice that on all our creeks, Blake, um, for the no more areas that are, uh, we generally say 10 to 15 feet from uh, the edge of the, uh, the bank um, up the slope. Um, and that's generally so because a couple things. One, um, you know, uh, actually maintaining it uh, with our machine, sometimes it, it, it becomes a, an issue with the equipment. So um, that's the first thing. But the second thing is, I think, you know, preserving the vegetation there, um, again, adds to the, the water quality um, and just the general health of, of our creeks and, and, and our river. Great. Uh See that there's a question that's coming in on the chat from Sean where he's asking, will there be any water quality monitoring during the weekly maintenance inspections? Um, in terms of parks inspections, no, but that is something that we have been discussing with our stormwater group on how we can include some water monitoring components with some of these um, NOMO areas in particular. There's one near the rodeo grounds, if you're familiar with Louisville off of Keeley. Um, that we are looking at doing some potential monitoring um, upstream and downstream of the NOMO area um, just to see if there's some benefits over time that we're seeing a difference in water quality. So um, with this particular site, I'm not sure what the logistics might look like of, of water quality monitoring, but we have considered that for some of our other NOMO areas that are within the city for sure. All right. Well, thank you, Mindy and Mike. That's uh, all the time we got um, for this uh, presentation. So thank you all again for, for sharing your information. Um, next, I want to introduce Dr. Fawad Jabber, who is a professor professor and extension engineering specialist uh, with the Texas A&M AgriLife Center in Dallas since 2007. Uh, he's done a lot of work uh, with stormwater management, green stormwater infrastructure, and stream restoration. Um, and so he'll be presenting, uh, his presentation is incorporating green infrastructure or low impact development, open space and nature-based systems into hazard mitigation plans. Uh, Dr. Jabber, uh, you can take it away. Very good. Well, thank you for reading the title. It was so long. I was going to take half of my presentation. Uh, so this is the official title of the study. This is, uh, uh, it's a it's a project that's funded by EPA and uh, uh, the city of Denton is a, a huge collaborator on the project and uh, also other groups the, the NCT COG is involved in the project uh, and basically uh, we are looking at, at green infrastructure as a solution for for hazards specifically flooding so next slide so if you are, I'm assuming a lot of you are familiar with green infrastructure, but if you're not, basically these are practices that are nature-based in most cases. They have some type of vegetation or at least water touches the soil directly. Uh, and their main purpose has a stormwater management. They've been developed originally as a water quality solution because uh, they're small, but they're distributed and they can integrate into a development so instead of the parking space you put permeable pavement instead of a median in your parking lot or in your road you can put a bioretention or a rain garden or a bioswale you can put a green roof on the top of your of your building so you can integrate these practices into a development that's why they're called low impact development and they do their job managing water so uh, uh, even though they were developed for water quality improvement enough of them can have a good impact on flood reduction. Uh, they, are, they, they have other benefits, they have better aesthetics, they can provide better locations for uh, wildlife, better habitat for wildlife. They can reduce erosion, provide recreation ability, sequester carbon and, and many other things. So they're really great and uh, have been commonly used by stormwater manager and it's they be increasingly used here in the DFW area too. Next slide. Natural hazard mitigation plans, they're, they're requirements from uh, the federal government. Most uh, cities have one and basically if you are, there are certain types of, uh, of disasters that can occur uh, and they happen on a regular basis so you can expect you're expecting this to happen you know if you don't live near a volcano you're not going to consider volcano 
disasters as one of your problems. But if you live in an area that that uh, is uh, coastal and gets hurt by hurricanes, then you have to prepare for hurricanes. Most inland areas like uh, the Dallas area, the Denton, Denton County, we're really uh, vulnerable to, to flooding, really. We get, uh, as we've seen in the previous lectures, we've had a huge increase in urbanization in this area uh, accompanied with a change in storm water, uh, I mean, in storm characteristics. We're getting uh, 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 higher intensity storms uh, happening more frequently. So we're getting more more flooding as a problem. So since uh, uh, the flooding is, you know, when you combine it with an area that is uh, can doesn't take care of the impacts of that disaster, then you have a vulnerable system, and you need to develop you develop a plan that have action items. That's what the most important thing is, in order to reduce the impact of that natural hazard on that vulnerable system. Next slide, please. So is green infrastructure a flood hazard mitigation uh, uh, solution? Uh, the, this is a new concept. It hasn't been looked at as, as such. And so this is part of the objective of the study is to investigate and show that GI can be a flood hazard mitigation uh, solution. And uh, the, we know that the uh, green infrastructure is not going to capture the 100 year storm but uh, uh, it's going to put a good dent in it. It's definitely going to eliminate uh, 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 flooding that, that happens on a, on a regular basis. If you have flooding that's happening uh, 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 every time you get the two-year storm uh, because of many factors, uh, the change in topography, uh, undersized inlet, undersized stormwater network, uh, badly maintained stormwater met network, all these things can lead to flooding for even smaller storms. And then big storms uh, can, can, of course, make that problem higher. By capturing anywhere between one and a half to three inch uh, storms, the runoff from one and a half to three inch storms, you're going to put a dent in flooding for any type storm, right? So in the, the 100 year event, which is nine inches, if you have green infrastructure that's capturing anywhere between one and a half and three inches, your that your hundred year event is going to be uh, six inches, not the nine inches. So the flooding will be reduced, and there will be uh, a benefit uh, uh, for the cost associated with it. So, so yes, GI should be looked at as a flood hazard mitigation pro uh, uh, solution. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, currently. Uh, so uh, we, why, why would you encourage the uh, use of green infrastructure rather than just put uh, uh, bigger, uh, uh, bigger pipes, right? And 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 the gray system, what we call gray infrastructure, just put more of the concrete system that take the water as fast as possible to the nearest water body. Well, there's problem with that. The the one of the main problem is that when you don't uh, increase infiltration of storm water and you don't uh, uh, and you allow it to flow as fast as possible towards stream and rivers you are getting flooding in the rivers this is what we've seen in the previous uh, presentations your riparian zones will start get flooded more often you get erosion over there in addition you are sending a lot of pollutants in that water without any treatment directly to rivers and streams. And so, so you have water quantity problems, water quality problems when you use gray infrastructure exclusively. The other problem with gray infrastructure is that uh, it's very costly. So it's they're big projects to install gray infrastructure. Uh, uh, you build your system to take care of your 100-year storm. And uh, uh, with our current climate change conditions, we're expecting the 100-year storm to increase by 50% by the year 2045. This is in 25 years from now, we're expecting the 100 year storm to be now 14 and a half inches uh, in 24 hours. And so the trying to change a gray infrastructure to match changing climate is going to be very difficult. While green infrastructure is a much simpler construction project, and can be installed in uh, uh, various locations and therefore 
can be much easier to be used as a direct flood uh, mitigation solution than a large gray infrastructure project. Next slide, please. Uh, our SGI now considered in hazard mitigation, it is not in most of the US. This is a, a, a great idea that the EPA has uh, come up with, and uh, it has been this, a project like mine uh, has been completed in a couple of locations. I'm going to say there's definitely one in Oregon that was completed, and if I remember correctly, there's another one in Pennsylvania. So we are I think the third project of this kind in the US looking at developing material and 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 joining uh, stormwater manager and uh, hazard mitigation professionals together in the same room to come up with uh, uh, a, 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 a plan to integrate GI in the hazard mitigation plans uh, in the area. So currently in most of the natural hazard uh, risk plans that you look at there is no mention of green infrastructure. Usually most of the money goes to uh, either uh, reconstruction or uh, 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 taking houses to a higher level, building levees, the solutions that actually are dealing with the post effect of the, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, the flooding. What we're saying here, use some of that money for prevention, right? An ounce of pre prevention, so, so use it Whenever you have an area that floods and you get funding from uh, uh, from FEMA, then take that money and put some of these GIs. This is a prevention strategy for the future, rather than putting money to just uh, 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 fix what what was destroyed by these floods uh, as a result. So uh, the other thing is that GI and LID has so many co-benefits, so many uh, uh, ecosystem services benefits that uh we want to encourage and see more of them regardless of the flooding so this would be one of the ways where we will get more green infrastructure uh, installed in our cities and get all these benefits from small storms to large storms too next slide next slide please so again uh part of the objective is to do a study to see how green infrastructure impacts f flooding but really one of the biggest uh, goals is to uh, uh, get both EPA water quality and water uh, uh, volume uh, uh, goals match with FEMA's flood protection goals into one program uh, such that these two can 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 co-fund or work together on projects that have the same goal and satisfy the objectives of both agencies. This model right here that we have in this slide applies to each city. In each city, we have stormwater uh, managers and we have people that are risk assessment and uh, 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 hazard and, and uh, uh, disaster uh, uh, professionals. And so we want, part of this project is we want these people to be in the same room during this project uh, period so that they can understand that uh, they have common uh, objectives and there are solutions that can meet both of their objectives. So next slide, please. So in this study, this is what we're doing. It's very specific to Denton County. The funding was given to Denton County. It was, uh, 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 Blake was part of the discussions that I wasn't part of because I just applied for the grant and obtained it, but Blake was a part of the original discussions to, uh, 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 obtain funding from EPA, develop that proposal, and it was based on the Denton County Green Belt that we are starting to look at the preservation of uh, riparian corridors, and we are interested in a study that that will uh, uh, increase GI in these areas and in Denton County uh, uh, to address uh, flooding as well as deterioration of riparian corridors. So the, the project came in and what we're planning to do here is uh, uh, to analyze what's out there, what's what's the status of uh, green infrastructure in Denton County, what are the different cities doing, what is the county doing, and what kind of natural, national hazard mitigation plans do they have uh, on paper? Do they include a GI in these plans? We did an analysis already and the answer is no. And then the hope is that uh, we can start adding the term terminology of green infrastructure in the flooding sections of the National Hazard Mitigation Plan of the different cities. 
The second objective of this plan is to have stakeholder meetings, to have people from both groups, the, the hazard mitigation and the stormwater management meet in the same room, have the same discussions, and uh, give us feedback on our project as we are developing it. Third part is we're developing a GIS-based tool uh, to identify the upstream zones where flooding can occur. So unlike the, the project, the, the project, the first presentation where we've seen the focus on riparian zones, we are looking at areas where we can start with, that would be ideal to put green infrastructure in to capture storm water way before it gets to the riparian area. So we want to identify these areas where uh, uh, upstream rather than the, the one that flood because the stream is overflowing in banks. The, we want to identify the ones that flood because of the topography, because of uh, the type of soil, because of the, the elevation, uh, and, and capture that storm upstream before it gets to the, to, to, to the stream. And eventually, uh, if we, uh, we do capture enough of it, hopefully it would reduce the times these streams overflow their banks on a regular basis. Finally, we would be developing, and this is where we are now at that point, developing a, a, a document that have recommendations for both GI professionals and uh, hazard mitigation professionals on how to design specific GIs and LITs in these identified areas in order to have uh, 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 optimize the reduction of flooding in these areas. Next slide, please. So, so who are the stakeholders? Again, usually when, when you're talking mitigation flooding, you, you have emergency manager, public works, fire specialist, law enforcement come. In this project, we're adding the water folks. We're adding the natural resources managers, the floodplain specialist, the water quality specialist, and one, we're going to put them in the same room. We already did once. We're planning to do that uh, one more later in this year. And uh, two, we're hoping that we can exchange enough information between everyone so that the next time there is uh, uh, funding through FEMA that uh, uh, they talk to each other and maybe they can start planning the uh, installation of GIs in, that, uh, in the watershed. Next slide. And again, there's co-benefits, as we said, there's there's a, a flood reduction, but also improved water quality, improved community benefits. There's potential to reduce fire hazards, especially if one of the GIs used is rainwater harvesting, then you can have water in, in locations where usually you wouldn't have any. And uh, uh, again, this is federally funded. So here I'm plugging in the federal agencies, the, uh, every uh, every dollar spent by federal agencies on, on flood mitigation or on, on, on hazard mitigation is saving the society $6. So here you have it. Next slide. So the, we're working in Denton County. So the whole county is, is our uh, uh, study area. And you can see probably many of you can identify their cities in here. Clearly, the city of Denton uh, forms a large portion of the uh, the county, but you can see Louisville is highly in it, Carrollton, there's parts of Frisco, part of the city of Dallas, Flower Mound, uh, Fort Worth, and many small communities around the area that would benefit from the project. Next slide. So we're, as I mentioned, we're planning to develop a GIS uh, tool. Basically, it's a tool that will uh, be provided and put online at the end uh, uh, of the project where different people can access that website and go and zoom in to their specific area to identify where are zones that are uh, uh, have high potential for flooding and are high priority for green infrastructure insta uh, uh, installation. And then with the accompanying document that we would be producing by the end of the year, uh, they will be able to follow a step-by-step -step procedure so that they can design green infrastructure and quantify the potential benefit of green infrastructure that they would put in their, uh, uh, in their zone. Uh, uh, the, for us, the, 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 the GIS tool is basically uh, several physiographic layers, uh, which are the elevation, soils, land use, NDVI being an index of vegetation, and flow accumulation have been 
all ranked from one to five in priorities, one being uh, uh, very low potential for flooding, so low priority, and five being very high uh, potential for flooding and high priority. Uh, and then we combined all of these together to produce a final priority map for flooding. So next slide, we'll show you what we did. So here they are, this is Denton County. So the slope, high slope regions, uh, flow water flows very fast in high slopes, so it can have a higher potential for flooding. You can see the regions of high slope in, are, are in dark red, and the flatter, uh, the, the, the less slopey areas are, are in yellow. The elevation, we know that flat areas, uh, uh, usually at the uh, downstream end of watershed, have a higher tendency to flood. So the, the flatter the area, the lower the elevation, I mean, uh, the, the lower the elevation, that's where we as, uh, assume that uh, flood will accumulate as compared to the higher elevations. Flow accumulation, this is a uh, GIS produced uh, map that using the elevation map. And it would tell you uh, if water is flowing, where would it accumulate? So these areas would become high priority for flooding. The land cover, this is the land use, basically. We've divided it into uh, five categories, water, bare soil, uh, uh, low vegetation, high vegetation, and urban. And urban uh, uh, is, is uh, highly ranked in those systems. Water areas have been highly ranked because even though, uh, uh, because if they're in, inland, there's a big potential for these areas to flood. Uh, you know, clearly Lake Louisville shows here as a five priority. But because it's low in most of the others, it won't show finally as the highest priority since it's pure water. The soil we had uh, we obtained from uh, USDA uh, a soil map, and in that soil map there is a classification for the type of soils that develop in uh, low frequency floods, me medium frequency floods, and and very high frequency floods. So you can see here th these areas based on their soil they're classified into areas that have high, medium, or low frequency uh, of flooding. And finally, the vegetation index. If you have very little vegetation, you are higher, uh, you have a higher potential for uh, flooding. If you have a lot of vegetation or your water, then it's a lower, uh, 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 lower chance of flooding. And so as a result, you can see uh, the vegetation is, 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 is lacking, I'm going to say, in, in Denton County in general, and there's a high potential for for flooding in most of the county, but the, the dark red points are here what's important. Again, we're, we're, I'll show you the result of adding these all together, uh, and this is going to identify for us critical areas that we should target for GI installation, and then the accompanying document is going to provide an approach to how to do uh, GI design in, in in one area. One specific area probably will be chosen somewhere in an urbanized area, and we will have a, 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 a design exercise in that uh, project. Next slide. This is the uh, uh, flood priority map. This is uh, uh, the, all these other uh, uh, physiographic uh, uh, characteristics added together, and it, this is the whole county. Again, uh, at this size, it might be very difficult to identify where your city is and, and what part, uh, are you in that very red point or are you actually in the uh, yellow one right next to it. So so hopefully when we put this online on a, on a, uh, uh, on a ArcGIS online system, then you can zoom in and uh, to your area, or you can probably put a put an address, and it will take you to it, and you can identify whether you fall into a high uh, flood risk area or a low flood risk area. If you're in a city and you have again uh, funding through uh, uh, FEMA to 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 start mitigating floods, uh, this is where you want to go. You want to zoom into your city, identify the points that are uh, uh, dark red, and then uh, as you come down to that square, you will you will be able to identify locations that where you can put a GI. Is there a parking lot? Can you put that uh, bioretention in the median? Uh, is there uh, uh, large buildings where you can put rainwater harvesting to capture some of them? 
that rainfall? Is there a, a, a parking lot you can use permeable pavement in? You can assess in that square how much space you have for green infrastructure, and then you can design it, and then we're using a basic calculation methodology. You can estimate how much uh, runoff can you reduce as a result of your design. Next slide. Here I'm zooming on the same map to the city of Denton, and you can see here's the city of Denton. I have the uh, uh, roads uh, overlaid in that map, so you can identify the different locations. If you know Denton, you know where, where you'd be in here. Uh, and, and you can see that it shows that the northern area, I think it's Cooper Lake uh, Creek, uh, or Cooper Creek, uh, is, is a high potential for flooding in general. Then you have specific uh, uh, locations here, and there that needs more attention than others. Most of the city is at level three, so most of the city is can be a thir third priority. Uh, 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 I guess the, that dark yellow here is fourth and the uh, green is fifth, so these are very low priority, but definitely the dark red and the uh, regular red, these are areas that need attention. So you can, as I said, zoom in to that square right here Look what there is. Is there? Why is it flooding? And uh, uh, try to put enough green infrastructure to capture uh, uh, runoff within it and force increased infiltration. And that is a solution for the near future. Next slide, please. So the <clears throat> the, the one thing we didn't add to this is the Denton County Green Belt Plan, which is also a prioritized uh, 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 riparian zone system. And the second thing that I was planning to put and I didn't put is the FEMA 100 year and 500 year project. Why didn't I do that? It's basically because if we do these, because they focus on the riparian areas, then it would uh, it will not show us where the problem areas are inland. It would have converted all of Denton in the previous slide to orange because suddenly the 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 uh, the uh, risk will focus on these riparian zones i am planning to add those and and put a different weight on them and then produce a second map that would include riparian zone classification too because riparian zones especially in the green belt plan could be great locations to put green infrastructure to capture uh, runoff before it goes into the stream but uh, again if we make them if we increase their priority, uh, uh, we will we will not be able to identify easily uh, locations inland that are problem areas. And so, even though we'll prevent that flood from uh, causing uh, the streams to overflow their banks, uh, if we don't look at upstream areas, we might miss local zones that flood on a regular basis and not solve their problem. Next slide, please. Again, stakeholder involvement, we've had already one stakeholder meeting that was on March 14. As I was giving my presentation, I got a, an email saying that this, the, the, the Dallas uh, AgriLife Center is closed for uh, uh, for good. Everybody has to work from their home. And so uh, uh, we did the, the stakeholder meeting half in person, half in online. Uh, uh, these days are gone now and uh, uh, I, uh, uh, we we still have a good stakeholder list. Now that we're starting to come up with the results, we're going to send the stakeholders that put their name for the project. Uh, uh, we're going to send them an update on, on where we are. And then the plan, it says here, second and final meeting in early 2021. COVID put uh, 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 a stop on this, delayed it. So now we, the project has been extended. We're really hoping to have our second meeting maybe in September this year. Uh, if things are better, we'll have it uh, in person. Uh, if if there's st we're still having problem, we'll probably have it uh, uh, hybrid, uh, even if if things are better in general, half online, half in person. But the goal is at this point to let people know what we have uh, and share the results of the final report, show them the tool, uh, make sure that they're 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 able to access it, get their feedback before we develop uh, uh, and uh, the the complete final report that we'll submit to EPA. Next slide. Uh, uh, one of the output also that we want is once people are familiar with the uh, with the GIS tool, uh, to have an outreach PowerPoint presentation that we will give every city that they can 
modify however they want to be specific to their city and then they be able to uh, uh, give that w either to the city uh, employees that are uh, would be interested in such a project or even to the public to increase uh, GI interest in uh, in uh, uh, in the public in general and and acceptance when there is uh, when we're using GI for hazard mitigation. Next slide. This is it. So this is my information. This is my email, my phone, uh, and if you are into that kind of thing, we even have a Facebook page, and I can take questions. We actually do not have time for questions, but I would encourage um, everyone if you are interested um, in this project to. Um, you can reach out to Dr. Jabber or um, let me know and um, we can uh, get you on the list for that that meeting. Um, and they can put some in the chat. I'll try to reply in the chat while... Yeah, if... yeah, that'd be great. Um, so next, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Bob Hart. Uh, he is the city manager for the city of Corinth and has been since January of 2017. Uh, and he will be talking about the city of Corinth's stormwater management uh, efforts and their green stormwater infrastructure program. So, Mr. Hart, I will turn it over to you. Thank, thank you. And it is great to be here this morning. And I uh, do want to start that uh, Dr. Uh, Jobber was, was uh, very uh, instrumental in a lot of the work that we've been doing uh, here in Corinth. So, next slide, please. And I always like to start with this because I think I think philosophically or conceptually, it's important to understand some of the approaches we that we take here, and and, and that is that we take a systems approach to dealing with these kinds of issues. And and so when I talk about systems, I'm talking about it you know, from the uh, perspective like of people like uh, Peter Singe and, and Daniel Kim, and and that is that there's when we look at the system here, we're looking at quality of life in print, and there's a there's a number of subsystems that make that up. And if you ever, or, or the tendency is to optimize a subsystem, you're going to uh, sub-optimize the system as a whole. And so when we're talking about this as a policy perspective, particularly at the council, and, and then even within the staff level, I, I think it's important to to, to keep that in perspective. And that is that tree preservation is important, but that will, uh, that can impair or, or limit uh, drainage. Uh, what you might do with drainage may impact your trails or your natural open spaces. It may uh, impact uh, some of the landscape regulations, uh, some of your economic development, housing development, and so forth. So, so you really want to be keeping an, a very open mind and looking and, and where your trade-offs are, and those need to be part of an ongoing conversation. I think that's where our council's been very good, looking at incentives and disincentives to move in some of these areas, as opposed to very strict regulations. And I think that allows for a much better overall systems approach to what's going on. So next slide. Uh, next slide, yeah. Okay. And then go ahead and get to the next slide here. And the next one. Uh, I'm sorry, back one. <laughs> uh, and so just very quickly here, I, I want to be cognizant of the time uh, of here. So we have revised our engineering standards manual uh, and have adopted the uh, ISWIM criteria. And of course, the ISWIM are those standards that's been uh, developed collectively here within the uh, North Central Texas COG area. We've adopted the uh, uh, drainage design manual, and we've also uh, updated and made a number of changes to our development codes. Uh, next slide. Uh, and we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, that's just on the ice standards. So when we uh, have looked at a lot of these areas, I mean, clearly what we're trying to do is address stormwater early in the development process. Uh, we're looking for integrated approaches and and paying attention to the uh, water quality and 
and uh, emphasizing the area during uh, construction. Next slide. Uh, and so when we talk about the, the watershed management uh, best practices, it's obviously based on the uh, ISTRAM standards, and, and that's important within the uh, COG region. Uh, up in our area, uh, uh, we're a silver uh, member there. Uh, Denton is Frisco and, and Irving that are kind of up here in the upper Trinity uh, 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 region. Uh, and so, so we're all taking this sort of approach. I think it's real important, uh, particularly with uh, Denton and Crint uh, working in tandem in that area. So next slide. Uh, yeah, we'll just, the, uh, there are just a few of these. I just wanted to, uh, uh, we're designing infrastructure to uh, fully developed conditions. I think that's a, a particular uh, uh, point I want to emphasize here. Uh, and then using the appropriation calculation methods. Uh, you, you heard Dr. Uh, Jobber uh, mentioned a little bit earlier about some of the greater intensity and development. And so using the appropriate calculation methods become real important. And then a lot of our approach is, is depending on the Denton County Greenbelt Plan and creating stream buffers and preserving open space to protect in those areas. Uh, next slide. Uh, so again, kind of re-emphasizing the point that, that we want to include the ice cream standards at the earliest stage, so that's really in the pre-development areas, uh, and, and then tying it to our uh, stormwater uh, pollution prevention program. So we understand that what we're doing in our streets and drainage area is, is, uh, is impacted by the development that's going on. And so we're linking those together. And, and that's what I would kind of go back to is conceptually with the, uh, uh, with the systems approach to thinking about these things. We don't want anybody operating uh, in isolation. So next slide. And so there's a number of uh, outcomes that we're looking here. Uh, the finished floor elevations is always going to be kind of at the top of the conversations when we're talking about some of the development, when people are coming in, what they're uh, concerned with. And then we, we've got to be very clear uh, in our drainage and floodplain easements. Uh, and establishing operations and maintenance procedures, practices uh, within uh, those areas. Uh, next slide. Still saying in the ISWAM and, and some of this criteria, uh, we're, we're interested in obviously in the conservation of, some of the natural features and resources uh, that are there. And then we also want to uh, have a lot of emphasis Dr. Jabber, you heard talk about the uh, low impact design. That's important with us. And then utilizing some water quality strategies within our uh, public rights of way. So that, again, that's an important part. Uh, and next slide. Uh, let's see. Let's see, we're going to the next slide. Yeah. And, and this is just saying that uh, with the uh, uh, new NOAA standards, looking at rain frequency, uh, and in and volumes and all, we're making sure that we're using the most up-to-date data uh, and applying that within our drainage standards and that the planning is being done, is being based on current data. Uh, next slide. Uh, and, and this is always just, I've always found kind of uh, interesting when you begin looking at the geomorphologic uh, uh, impacts along uh, Spring banks, and so we're here in Lynchburg Creek, and paying attention to um, some of the impediments you might have, the, what's happening to the uh, storm erosions, what's happening to your banks, the impact on the adjoining property owners. So taking a, a very uh, holistic look uh, at this area it is important, and I, I think that helps you prevent uh, uh, property damage that occurs uh, and, and so this becomes a part of our overall planning, the thinking, and again, 
it's time back. I don't want to overemphasize that, but or uh, overstate it. But on the on the systems approach, this is when you're really looking at what's going on uh, within within the creeks. Uh, next slide. Uh, we look at uh, the stream bank protection that, that flows out of this. Uh, it's uh, obviously there's, you've got to do some long-term planning in those areas, paying attention to what's happening on um, public property versus private property, and then where the emphasis is on uh, prevention. Next slide. We work with COG and, and use a lot of their standards for the uh, a complete streets approach where we're including uh, water quality uh, and and uh, and the development of in in those areas, and that's just the this slide's here just to emphasize that that's an important part of our strategy. Uh, next slide. We've adopted the uh, green belt plan. Uh, our council did that two years ago, uh, and and we're using that as a planning guide, and it helps instruct. Uh, the, the work that we're doing. And so next slide. Uh, and this is just stating that, uh, that that this is important to us. And we'll go on to the next slide. It's going to be a little bit of repeat here. Uh, where we're paying attention to those zones within uh, a, a thousand feet and then a thousand from one to five thousand feet of, in our case, Lynchburg Creek. Uh, here we're paying attention to some of the riparian buffers, bioswells, uh, and then other practices to in, improve water quality uh, when we're within a thousand feet of, of Lynchburg Creek. Uh, and then as, you, as we get a little further out, uh, looking at uh, conservation easements, that's where the, the, uh, the conversations, the relationship with the trust uh, becomes so important and I think that that's going to be that's a important part of our internal planning in in, in where we're going. Uh, but we see that that trust here as part of the solution. So that's what we really appreciate the, the hosting, the opportunity to speak in in, in this this kind of a setting. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this would this would uh, bring us to the end. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. If there's any questions, you can uh, certainly contact us. Uh, George Marshall is our city engineer, uh, is, is, is neck deep in this all the time, and we'd like to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Hart. Um, we're a little short on time, so uh, I want to get, <clears throat> get done uh, before noon, So, uh, but um, I'll leave his contact info up there for for a couple seconds and if uh george marshall if you want to put your contact information in the chat that's fine too or um and and once again if you need to get in, in touch with any of the speakers uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, but we're going to go ahead and i have one more short presentation um that um that i will be doing um so Today, uh, the Upper Trinity Conservation Trust, uh, we are announcing that we have a new grant program that uh, will support the Denton County Greenbelt Plan. Um, <clears throat> Thomas Muir talked a little bit about the trust at the beginning, uh, but just wanted to reemphasize that the Conservation Trust is a 501c3 nonprofit land trust. Uh, we can accept and hold conservation easements uh, in perpetuity. Um, and we're focused on the, uh, particularly the riparian areas and the watersheds of the Denton County reservoirs. Um, but obviously, um, any part of the watershed we are interested in uh, working with. Um, this allows the, the landowner, whether that's uh, a landowner or developer or city, to continue to own and use the land um, through this conservation easement, which is a voluntary agreement between the landowner and the land trust, uh, where, um, like I said, you continue to own and use the land, but it limits certain rights uh, to that land, but can, can continue to enjoy and use that land uh, to a certain extent. 
uh, it does run with the land in perpetuity, uh, but if that easement is donated, uh, the landowner may experience uh, potential tax benefits with that. Uh, in 2017, the trust, the Opportunity Regional Water District, and the Denton County Commissioners adopted the Denton County Greenbelt Plan. Um, you've heard it mentioned uh, several times in some of the previous um, presentations, but uh, this plan is, it's a voluntary plan uh, that's designed for cities, developers, uh, landowners, and, and others um, to guide the preservation of these green belts, uh, which is another term that we've we've given for, for riparian areas because what we want is for them to be green with vegetation and, and things like that to um, preserve the ecological functioning of these areas. So this plan identifies those strategic areas uh, based on some of the data presented before by Dr. Atkinson and, and others and other studies uh, and other uh, analysis that uh, we did with um, our consultant group. Um, and being a voluntary plan, we have a toolbox of implementation strategies that, uh, you know, if it's a city that adopts the plan uh, based on the unique circumstances in their community, they can adopt certain strategies, um, you know, depending on what's applicable for them. So as of today, these 12 entities have adopted the Greenbelt Plan um, and are um, implementing in, in different ways. And so um, if you do not see your city or town on here, um, or even developers could um, adopt the plan to you know, guide future uh, sustainability efforts, things like that. But if you're interested in learning more about the Greenbelt Plan and how you can adopt, um, then feel free to reach out to me. We're always available for presentations um, and um, other things with citizen commissions, city staff, uh, city town councils. So just feel free to reach out to me with any questions. But the grant program itself uh, does support implementation of the Greenbelt Plan so what we want to see is on the ground practices that will um, help accomplish that ultimate goal, which is protecting water quality in the uh, three Denton County reservoirs, uh, which are a major source of drinking water for, for North Texas. So some of those uh, projects that could be funded include uh, riparian restoration plantings or um, different things like that, uh, or land manager practices with landowners. Uh, you can see here, uh, this could be um, an example of cross fencing to protect a riparian area or create a separate riparian pasture that could be managed uh, better, but also in um, the plantings could be in rural or urban areas as well. Um, green stormwater infrastructure projects. Uh, this is uh, at the AgriLife Research Center in Dallas. Uh, this is Dr. Jabber's um, location. Uh, you can see this biofilter area, uh, bioswale in the parking lot. Uh, another good example in our area is the Doubletree Ranch Park in Highland Village. Uh, but then also just educational programs or activities that uh, will help further uh, the knowledge of our, our citizens to the benefits of preserving these areas. So who's eligible? Uh, landowners, municipalities, utilities, nonprofit organizations. Um, you know, we'd really like to see uh, some of these groups partner up and, and things like that. But feel free to reach out to me with any questions about that. Uh, the initial program funding for this is $10,000. Um, you know, it, that probably won't go all to one project. We want to try to leverage um, the little bit of money that we have as far as as far as we can. So, um, as we get applications come in, if we see that uh, we could use funds as matching funds for for other grant programs, uh, those are definitely opportunities 
we would like to take advantage of. Uh, but also, we see this grant program as a great opportunity for additional investment from uh, businesses or foundations or um, other organizations uh, or even individuals to uh, contribute to this grant program to see these on-the-ground practices being implemented in the watershed. Uh, applicants should have adopted the Greenbelt Plan. Um, you know, for landowners, that'll be a little, um, a little trickier, maybe something like a letter of support, something like that. So uh, feel free to reach out and we can, we can discuss what exactly that means. Uh, this program will uh, be administered by the trust. So they'll decide you know, which, which projects they wanna pursue, how much of the funding, uh, things like that. Um, and we'll be um, discussing, you know, with um, the applicants through the whole process. Um, and the application will be uh, available on our website at utct.org. Um, I forgot to check if it's on there yet, but if not, feel free to uh, email me. Here's my email address, um, baldridge at utrwd.com. Feel free, and I can easily email it to you as well. Um, so, um, with that, if anyone has any questions, uh, for I hope all of our speakers are still on, but um, feel free to put it in the chat box. Or if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask a question. Um, we can just we have a, a few minutes left, so. Um, but I do want to thank everyone for uh, coming today. Oh, and if um, I was trying to look while um, some of the other presentations were going on, but if you are wanting the TFMA credits, uh, please email me because there's not a great way to uh, download the, the attendee list. So um, that would help me out if you could just go ahead and email me that you're wanting those credits. Um, and for those who have attended, you'll soon be receiving a gift bag or a gift um, from us. So uh, you should expect that in hopefully the next week, depending on the postal system. So, um, all right, well, not seeing anything come in. Um, I'm going to